Now we open up to our foundation text, hallelujah, which is part of us on the wall back behind, well, over there. <laughs> hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, hallelujah. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. And we've been talking about for the past few Sundays what to do when faith seems weak and victory lost. And so we've talked about several things over this particular series. First one was recognize the source. If you don't know who the problem is and who the answer is, you're going to be in trouble to start with. If you, can't, if, you, if you believe some of the stuff that people preach about God's the reason you're sick and if you go to a healing service, that's the devil, you're, 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 you're just bottom, you're upside down to start with. Amen? Anybody ever bought a car and got upside down on it? Spent more on the car than it was worth? Don't raise your hand. I know his wives poking their husbands right now. Yeah, you had to have it, didn't you? You know, well, what, what is it? You try to go sell it and you, you've lost money to start with. You're in trouble. Well, if you come into the things of God and you're trying to walk by faith and you think God is, your, is, is the one putting stuff on you, and if you go over to that charismatic word of faith, Holy Ghost Church, and they're laying hands on the sick to get people well, and they're called, that's the devil, you're in trouble. Now, number one, you don't have any Bible to support that. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. So we, we talked about in the very first sermon that, you know, the thief, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came to give life. So Satan is the problem. Jesus is the answer. Amen. Amen. Then we said the second thing is be sure you have promises from God's word that cover what you ask for. Amen. Don't be praying for stuff you can't find Bible to cover. Like somebody else's wife. Well, I walked by her and got goosebumps. That was the Lord. No, that was your flesh. Amen. Are you here? It wasn't the Lord. It was your flesh. Your carnal, unregenerated, nasty flesh. Amen. Like my deal, is it nasty? All right. Then the third thing we said is be sure you're not living in sin. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, just now, if, if, I, if I nail you this morning, just kind of smile, say amen. Nobody will know I'm talking about you. All right? But it's kind of hard to have victorious faith. Amen? You know what to do when faith seems weak and victory lost? It's kind of hard to be in victory and f have strong faith, and you're sitting around your house with your computer looking at porn. It's an epidemic in the body of Christ. Ministers are getting caught up in it all the time now. It's just, it's just terrible. You know what? We, you know, and I, just, I just picked that one of the worst ones just so you could kind of get nailed between the eyes. But you know what? You could be in sin talking about your neighbor. You could be in sin flipping the car off next to you while you're riding down the road. <laughs> we had somebody that was in the church one time. They were riding down the road, and, they, and somebody came by and was messing with him, blew the horn at him. And, you know, and, and, and that person, before they knew it, had flipped them off. Turned out it was another church member <laughs> messing with them. I mean, they, I mean, they, they, they shot him up good. You're kind of like in, a, in Top Gun. You know, you know, shooting in the bird. Yeah, Goose, I know what the bird is, all right? Hallelujah. I mean, flipped them off big time. Then saw it was one of the church members. <laughs> Beware, lest your sins find you out. So it's just probably a good thing not to flip. Uh, yeah, we can see it. I mean, I can see Paul writing the scripture today. Flip no one off, lest you flip off a church member unawares. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'll be sure you're not living in sin. Now, listen, let me say something here about that. You know. The pastor might not know. Your wife or your husband might not know. Your kids might not know. Mama or daddy might not know, but you know. Beloved, if our, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Amen. Now, some people don't like to come to churches that say stuff like that because it makes me feel bad. No, you were already feeling bad when you got here. And then the Word of God addresses that and says, stop. No, Jesus, did, Jesus never condemned anybody. I mean, the woman came to him, caught in the very act of adultery. And he, you know what? And he didn't condemn her. Yeah, but he did say this and go and sin no more. He says, neither do I condemn thee. Now go and sin no more. So he didn't just say, hey, it was okay. <laughs> you were caught in adultery, no problem, that's okay. 
He, no, he said, basically, you're forgiven, but stop doing it. Thank you. That's not, that's, I'm not trying to put you, I'm just telling you the points. Third, I mean, the next one was, be sure there's no doubt or unbelief permitted in your life. Man, I'm going to tell you what, you can't let doubt enter in. You can't be standing in faith one minute and go, I sure hope it works the next. I've, I've tried to minister to people. I've been in healing lines or prayer lines. Had people come up, you know, go lay hands down. Now, when I lay hands on you, you're going to be healed? I sure hope so. Well, you're not going to be. Right. You're going to have to get in faith. Are you going to get in faith? <clears throat> well, no, you know, I, I remember one time I was, in, I was in church. It was in my home church down in Greenville or over in Greenville. You know, some, I guess if I say down in Greenville, here you think South Carolina, over in Greenville, North Carolina. Um, the, this lady, the pastor was out of town, and I was ministering and had a prayer line. And this girl comes up. She's got a neck brace on. I said, well, what happened? Well, I was in a car wreck, and I got whiplash. And I said, now look. And I got ready to pray for her, and the Lord stopped me. And I stepped back. I said, now, when I, I said, are you in a lawsuit? Yep. I said, if I pray for you, will you drop the lawsuit? Nope. I said, no, no, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it that you're going to believe God to heal you. And then you're going to sue somebody for tapping your back in and giving your neck a little kink. Hello. Now, which is it? You want the lawsuit or you want to be healed? Now, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't know so strong. And they went, I said, now, so I, now, I, I want to pray for you. But if I pray for you, you're going to get lost. They said, no. I said, I'm not praying for you. Walked off to the next person. Oh, Pastor Ed, that wasn't right. No, 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 no. She was going to hold it. She, I can't, she's not in faith. She's not in faith. She's holding on to a legal lawsuit in case she don't get healed. Now, how, there's no faith there. How can, we, how can I pray for her? We're not in agreement. And she wouldn't change. She had determined she was going to get some money. Now what? Do you want money? You want healed. Do you want to be in pain? Do you want to be free? Well, that went over so big. I thank you. We're going home. See you ultimately next week. I can't believe you. I sure did. I walked right up and left her standing there. I ain't praying for you. I know you all. I, I can see the looks. I can't believe it. Yes, I did. I gave her three chances and she wouldn't change her mind. <laughs> well, forgot. Fine. You're not in faith. You're putting more confidence in that neck brace and your lawsuit than you are in the healing power of God. And unless you're willing to give that up, you're not going to get it. So go ahead and get your money. Honey. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sure that, that went over real big. See, see that's what you're doing. You're letting doubt and unbelief in. You can't let doubt and unbelief in when you're believing God. Can you say amen? Next. Somebody, I know it's going to be some conversation at lunch today. Can you believe what Pastor Ed did? And I'd do it again, too. In a heartbeat. Boy, it got quiet in this Pentecostal church. I'm going to go out and change the name. Faith and Victory for Church of the First Frozen Chosen. Hallelujah. Next, since you've got no doubt and unbelief in your life, I'm going to take the neck braces off. I'll tell you, I, I guarantee you next time I have a healing life, you're, you're coming up here, you're going to be behind the neck braces on nothing. <laughs> but see, the Holy Ghost will tell you, I did not know she had a lawsuit. I got ready to pray for her. The Holy Ghost arrested me and told me to ask her that. Selah. Some of y'all just sitting there, and I, I, I can feel it. What would you have done? You don't know. Okay. <laughs> next, next, next. We're going to move on since y'all. Sincerely desire the benefit. You've got to have a desire for what you believe in God for. Yeah. <clears throat> you can't hope this works. You can't think that this is like, you know, uh, Hungry Jack instant potatoes. You put you know, this much butter and this much milk and this much water and salt and dump them in there and stir it up after you bring it to a bowl. You know, you got instant potatoes and there you go. You know, you can't think it's like open sesame and the door open. It's not, it's not sesame seed, but they kind of did it to make it sound cool for the, I guess, the storybook or whatever. Now, you've got to sincerely desire. You've got to have a desire, a strong desire. Did you know the word desire and the word lust in the Greek are the same word? Now, lust is just simply a, a um, perverted strong desire. All right? 
You can have a, you can, the Bible even says the spirit lusteth to envy. That mean, doesn't mean he's in, he's, in, he's in lust in the sense of perversion. He has a strong desire for us to do things. Amen. So the, so the Greek word desire and the Greek word lust are the same Greek word. Amen. So we got, we, in, in, in that sense, you have to have a strong, almost in, in, in comparison, that where somebody has lust for ungodly things, you have to have that kind of desire for godly things. Same word. Okay? So you have to desire with a strong desire that what you're praying about. Well, you know, we're going to call Pastor Ed over, and if he gets it, fine. If not, then we'll just go on and, you know, have the doctor take care of it, or we'll go on and, you know, we'll do whatever. So you don't, have a real, you don't have a strong desire. You're just kind of pulling the buttons, pushing the buttons and pulling the levers, hoping that so and maybe so, this shoulda, coulda, wouldas. You know, no, you've got to get past it. If you're going to have a life of faith, and you're going to have strong faith, and you're going to have victory, you've got to get to where you have strong desire for the things you're believing God for. Why? Why? Because if you don't have a strong desire, you won't have the tenacity to stay with it. Yeah. You'll give up. Amen. How many of you ever gone out to eat before? How many of you ever got to a restaurant? You say, well, let's go to so-and-so. Oh, let's go to Olive Garden. And you drive up, and they're outside hanging out on the, belt, the post, you know. And you see them sitting on the hood of cars with the little beeper things, all that kind of stuff. You get up, send your wife in because you pulled up in front of the door. And she comes back and says, hour and a half wait. And you drive off. With or without your wife. <laughs> if you want to live and not die, you better pick up the wife. Just saying. Uh, um, what will happen? You wanted to eat at Olive Garden, but you didn't have a strong desire. Who had a strong desire? Them idiots going to wait an hour and a half. I don't, I don't wait for food like that anymore. Now, I used to, when I was a kid, we, we would, uh, after, our, after our high school football games, <coughs> Everybody in Pitt County would go over to the, to Daryl's. Now Daryl's is not the same food that it used to be. I mean, back when I was in high school, we had meatball sandwiches and mushball sandwiches and lasagna, and I mean, it was more of a it was more of that kind of food, you know, real comfort food sandwichy kind of stuff that was you know aimed at the co the, the college high school crowd. Okay, I mean, now, now they got got all fancy fires. Uh, pff, anyway, I don't even go there anymore. But in high school, we would go pick up our dates, drive to Greenville. I mean, and stand in line for an hour and a half with the team you just beat in football or got beat by in football, which went off. But anyway, you know, and wait and wait and wait because you were going to eat at Daryl's. It was a cool thing to do. Now I got to a certain age that if I went to Daryl's and I saw a line, I didn't, even, I didn't even pull in. I just drove off because I didn't have that strong of a desire. It would have been nice. We would have enjoyed it, but I am not committed to eating there at that, at that expense. However, on other things, you go to the theme park. They've opened the brand new ride. You know what I'm talking about? This, this past year in Pigeon Forge, they opened the new winged roller coaster at Dollywood. Now, it is the only winged roller coaster in the North American continent. That means it's got a center track, and the two seats on each side sit out off to the side of the track. Nothing above you, nothing below you. It is out of sight. And now I stood in line an hour and a half for that. I had a strong desire to ride that. Woo! And it was worth every second of it. Oh, my. Oh, my. I'm telling you. Now, when it comes to things in the, th in the, in the Word of God, believing God, now I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes people get where it's just not worth their faith to, get to believe God to take care of things. They don't have strong enough to desire to stay after it. you got to sincerely desire the benefit and get after it. Because if you don't, the first chance to get an out, you're out. I'm believing God for money. Well, you know, I'm believing God for $10,000 because I want to buy such and such. And all of a sudden you realize, I don't even really care if I get such and such. It ain't worth putting my effort out there on my faith. Go ahead, shoot, shoot me with your Nerf guns. All right. Next, hallelujah. Ask God in faith, nothing wavering. Amen. When you ask God in faith, don't waver. You got, you got to stay steadfast. You got to stay on. You got to stay on it, man. Hello. Now, have you ever seen girls date? 
I mean, one week he's the hottest hunk in the school. But next week, somebody hotter and hunkier shows up. What happens? She dumps pre-hunk for bigger hunk. She wavers. I love you. I love you. I love you. I don't. I hate you. But next week they hate them. As I see high school breakups. In the morning they love them. In the afternoon they hate them. That's wavering. Hello. I mean, you know, that kind of mindset where you, I mean, one minute you're for it and the next minute you're against it, that's wavering. You come in the church and Pastor Ed preaches a sermon, hallelujah, and stirs you in your faith, glory to God, hallelujah, and then he teaches you that you can go out and have what you say. You walk out the door, get in the car with your wife, glory to God, I'm going to believe God. Get home, run into a little trouble, I guess. You know what, I'm just not with that. Yeah. Oh, you turn on, here's the worst thing. Turn on the TV and somebody give us some down and run out testimony about how God put something on them. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's me. You wavered. You went from believing God to, oh, my, that must be my case. Sometimes God answers prayer three ways. Now, I grew up classical Pentecostal. That's what we were taught. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Here's the big one. Sometimes Maybe. Well, yeah, the Bible says he answers prayer really one way. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and our amen acknowledges its truth to the glory of God in us. That's Wayne with paraphrase of, of that passage. King James says and all the promises of God in him are yea and amen. But really, you know, the, the Greek carries it out that God says yes to his word. And our amen, amen is a covenant term because it means so be it. It means I come into agreement with what God said. God doesn't say no to his word. Now, I was taught that he did. And sometimes he'll say yes, and sometimes he'll say no, and sometimes he'll say maybe. Find me scripture. I got scripture the other way. You find me scripture your way, and then we'll settle it. Now, let me just save you a lot of time. It ain't there. It just ain't there. But yeah, but that's what I was taught. Grand grandma used to say, I know grandma. My grandmama used to say it. You would think, my God, she, she'd seen it written in gold lettering in the Bible. And I found it one day over in the book of First Opinions. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where, where was it at? You? It was right after that scripture that says the Lord helps those who help themselves. And right after all that, it said cleanliness is next to godliness. And it finished out this way. The Lord don't heal anymore. That passed away the day the last apostle died. And that's all the book of first opinions. You know what you can do with the book of first opinions? It's good kindling. Y'all know what kindling is. Some of you, you folks too city-fied now. Don't even know what kindling is. You start a fire with it. Amen. All right. So, asking faith, nothing wavering. Next, don't tolerate a thought to the contrary, which is where we are today. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. Once you've done it, you know, you've got, you can't let thoughts come that are counterbanding what you're believing God for. Now, I understand all these other things have gone before. You've already got scripture for what you're believing for. So we're not talking about stupid stuff. You're not believing for my wife, not believing for my car, not believing for my house, not believing for somebody else's dog or whatever, not trying to have their life. Now, you found scripture for what you're standing for. You're standing on it. <clears throat> now, you can't let thoughts to the contrary of what the Word of God says. Now, you will have well-meaning, and I say that with excessive grace to it being well-meaning Christians, who will come along, and you'll say, well, I'm believing God for such and such, and they'll say, now, brother, yeah, that's in the Bible, all right, but you know what they are? They're a goat. Goats just run around and butt everything. They'll butt a tree if they can't find another goat to butt. Hello, you ever seen goats? They'll lock up with each other, but they'll lock up with a tree, man. They just like, they just like they want, all that, that's all they want to do. You got Christians who are just goats. They just want to run into a tree and butt something. And so here you come along. Well, you know, I was at a church the other day, and the, and, oh. Now, I know people have been told that about it. You better stay away from that church. That Ed Taylor, that's a cult. Hello? He's a Hagenite. Now, I'm a Christian. 
Dad Hagen, I look at him as a spiritual father. The Bible says you have many teachers, but not many fathers. He is a spiritual father to me. But you can't find Bible against what I believe. I can find a whole, I mean, you know, we got people who, who say we're a cult, and then they go around and say, you speak in tongues in our church, we'll throw you out. And yet, I got a scripture in the Bible that says, forbid no man to speak in tongues. Yes, it says forbid no man to speak in tongues. Hello? Come on now. There's Bible, I mean, there's Bible schools, there's Christian colleges. If you, they, they put in their application. If you speak in tongues, this is the wrong school for you to come to. Don't apply. Actually, when I actually went as far as say, there's no need to apply. And they call me a cult. Hello? Because we say, the gifts of the Spirit are for today, and the Bible actually says, don't forbid them to speak in tongues. So who's, who's, who's the error? I believe it, and you tell them they can't. And I got scripture that says you can't forbid them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That, 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 that which is appropriate has passed away. Oh, really? Because when Paul was talking about it, he went on and said that, that then then will be known even as we're known. How many know him like you're known? Didn't think so. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. He ain't talking about the Bible. He's talking about when Jesus returns. Do you know that there'll be no need for tongues or interpretation of tongues when Jesus comes back? Hello? Then those things will pass away. But not until. The church needs them. All right, so you got Bible school students. I, I don't, I, I'm not out to hurt anybody. I don't want to call any names. But they're in, they're in a Bible school, and the, and the Bible school students, will, um, you know, they, they think, they, I've been saved three weeks, and I know everything. Most of them don't even know how to get in and out of the rain. You know, they got zeal, they're turned on for the Lord, they're excited about the Lord, but they need, they need some seasoning and growing up. But they'll come along, and they'll un try to undo what people are getting from God. Because they got a feeling. <laughs> The Lord talked to me. No, you just got to, I mean, you got to chill. I've seen people get those, and the Lord won't even, they're full of the devil. You walk outside in the winter and get one of them. Hello? Walk out without a coat on or whatever, you'll get a chill. Like, oh, God, it's cold. That's not the Holy Ghost. Are you here? I believe, I believe we can sense the presence of God, but just because you get some kind of bump don't mean it's God. So, I'm, here, I'm getting where I'm going. Don't, don't, put, don't worry. Thoughts to the contrary will come to what you're believing for. And you can't have that. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, verse 16 through 21. It says, therefore, and then I want you to put it up in the NIV. Because after I get done, I'm going to read it, I'm going to read it from the NIV. It says, um, therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, that means natural Israel, okay? But also that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Woo! Has charismatic word of faith people taken a hit for having a good confession? Now, I don't go around and say I'm not sick. That's, that's, not, that's not true. But I do say I believe that I received my healing according to 1 Peter 2, 24. Uh, because of God's law is higher than my circumstances, I declare I'm the healed of the Lord. Uh, you're a cult. You're, you're out there. Mind, science, of religion. Well, God was a mind, science, religion because he called those things which be not as though they were. Amen. Are y'all here? Have y'all gone home? I believe Weymouth translation, yeah, Weymouth says this, he gives life to the dead and makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Now, when people start acting and doing what God said he did, they call us a cult. Now, something's wrong with that. But they on. The, the devil's trying to use them to get you to say what you got. I already know what I got. I'm trying to get rid of it. If sickness is on me, I'm trying to get rid of it. If, if poverty is trying to overtake me, I'm trying to get rid of it. I don't need to keep saying what I got. I need to say what I want. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Amen? 
not keep saying what you got, keep saying what you got. No, God made reference to, God spoke to Abraham and to Abraham, changed his name to Abraham and started calling him Abraham. He was making reference to him. Something that did not exist, the father of many nations, as though it did. He changed his name and started calling him the father of many nations, even when he didn't have it. God did that. Well, it was God. Be imitators of God as dear children. Think about that now. Abram was called Abram until God appeared to him when he was 90 and 9 and said, this time next year you'll have a child. Hello? And thou shalt not be called Abram anymore, but thou shalt be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, wait a second. A father of many nations I have made thee. He ain't got nobody. The only one he's got was with Hagar, who was the bond servant, who went into her because his wife Sarah said, go into my bond servant, Hagar, and see if she'll have a child, and she did. Hello? And when, and when God appeared to Abraham when he was 99, or Abraham when he was 99, and said, you know, uh, I'm gonna have, you're going to have a child, he said, oh, the Ishmael might live before thee. He said, now look, I'm going I'm to bless Ishmael because you asked me to, but he's not the promise. So anything concerning Ishmael is not our pattern. Anything in regards to Ishmael is not the pattern for the believer. Why? Because it was of the flesh and not a promise. He said, but I'm going to bring, a, I'm going to bring one out of your loins, out of Sarah. And he's the promised seed. And I'm not going to call you Abram anymore. I'm going to start calling you the father of many nations. God started calling him the father of many nations with no child. As a matter of fact, the bun won't even in the oven. Hello? How do you know? This time next year, that's a year. Sarah wasn't pregnant. It took about three months. Maybe it took her three months to get over the shock. I don't know. Lord, I'm 90 years old, I'm going to have a baby. Now, Guinness Book of World Records says someone was 65 with artificial inseminated. No, 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 no. See, Guinness Book doesn't recognize Bible. <coughs> and if you're looking at stuff in Guinness Book, you know it's fruitcakey anyway. Or is that Ripley's Believe It or Not? That was Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah, how many remember that? A little magazine called Ripley's Believe It or Not. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead, calls those things which be not as though they were. Listen, it's Abraham who against hope believed in the hope that he might become the father of many nations, according, 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 according. According. Y'all hear? Underline that in your Bible. I can't write my Bible. Get rid of yours. Go to our bookstore. Buy a, a, a writable Bible. We'll show you when you can write in. All right? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Are you here? And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not. At the promise of God being fully persuaded, I'm sorry, um, but was through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded. Now, let me say something here, folks. That that which you promise is able to, pull, to perform. You're not going to get fully persuaded with Montel and Oprah in the background while you're trying to get in the faith. Especially if Dr. Phil's on the program. Or if you're watching The View in the morning. Now, I'm going to tell you what. Not one of those shows is worth your time. Are you here? Well, I like, I like listening to Oprah. Are you kidding me? These people are so full of the devil and so ungodly. And well, they got Elizabeth Hassel back on there, and they, they crucify her every chance they get. Hello? <clears throat> we got, they, got, they got their, um, their token Christian on there so they can annihilate her. I think John Stewart's funny. And John Stewart's full of the devil. 
You're not going to get in faith feeding on all that and then try to get, in the, get your Bible out and get a little bit of faith to get some miracle from God. It just ain't going to happen. You've got to get into the Word and into the presence of God until what? You're fully persuaded. Why? Then you can stand on what God said. It says, the Bible said, hear what he said. He who against hope. Now, one translation says, look, if you've got the NIV up for just keep it up there for me. The NIV on verse, around verse uh, 18. Just put it up there for me. Hang got it? NIV's not on there. Put the Amplifier's not on there yet. I got to buy the license for them. Put the ASV up there. Somebody. Forget it. I got the NIV on mine. All right. I was going to just have it so I wouldn't have to switch back and forth. All right. Hallelujah. Yeah, I got, I got the CIB. That's why I didn't look right. Hallelujah. All right. I'm sorry, guys. I had to. Didn't work for it. What verse was on? 17 or 18? 18. Listen to this. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father of many nations. The, uh, the Amplified Bible says, um, for Abraham, human reason for hope being gone. In other words, there was no reason to have hope. Having there been there? There's just no reason to have hope. Amen? So human reason for hope being gone, hope and faith. In other words, now the Bible word, the Bible word hope does not mean twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Okay? Understand that. When we're talking about Bible hope, biblical, now a lot of Christians say, I'm just hoping and praying, and that's what they're talking about. But when you see the word hope in the Bible, it is not that kind of wishful thinking that something will come to pass. Like last night, um, you know, it was wishful thinking at 1627 of the Carolina game that they were ever going to come back and win that ball game. I'm talking about 1627 of the first half. That's three minutes and 33 seconds into the game. They were down 14 nothing. Now, I watched the rest of the game just to see if they could even make a game of it. Nope. Hello. I mean, it was just, you know, it was just, I mean, you're hoping, you're wishing, and then they get down there, and, you know, and they made that little bit of run at three minutes. Got it down to 12. So, Woo, they're going to run. I mean, just going to hit another three. Nope. Right back out. Now, you, that, that's, what are you doing? You're not hoping, you're wishing. You think they're going to win? I sure hope so. What you're saying, I wish they would. <laughs> what you're really saying is, I know, dog. I knew going into the game that for them to win last night was, you know, the chances were somewhere between slim and none. And when, and when the zebras jumped in in the first three minutes, I mean, that was it. Now, Jay Billis, former Duke player alumni, even said on one of the calls of that first three minutes, that should have been a basket for Carolina with a, with a, with a free throw. But they called him for a charge. It was horrible. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that happened in that first three minutes that set the game up. And by, by that point, I went, that's it. I, I said, you throw in the towel, stick a fork in them. But I said, it did three minutes and 33 seconds into the game. Game was over. And it was. Now, I watched it hoping. Not Bible hope, but human hope, which was I was wishing they could come back. It didn't happen. I mean, and of course, when you throw bricks at the backboard, you don't, you don't get a chance either. I mean, they threw bricks at both ends, big square ones. I mean, they, they go up for the free throw, you can hear it hit the rim. Thud. I mean, so bad it hit thud on the rim. I was wishing. We, now, look. Quit, now, wait, why are you talking about the ball game? Because I'm trying to make a point. Understand that when the Bible refers to hope, it's not talking about you watch somebody and wishing something good would happen or something you want to happen. That's wishing. That's really not hope. It's not Bible. Bible hope is expectation. Bible hope is an expectancy. Hello. So it says here in Amplified, no human reason for hope. Amen. He hoped in faith. Amen? He hoped in faith. In other words, he had an expectancy that even though there was no reason he could wish for it to happen, he had an expectancy his faith could produce it. Why? Why could his faith produce something that there was no human reason to wish it could happen? Amen? Why? He 
had an expectancy in his faith that he should become the father. I'm, I'm paraphrasing now because that's what about the word hope means, expectancy. His, his expectancy in faith that he should become the father of many nations. Why? As he had promised. You can have an expectancy because God promised. Now, God doesn't have to speak to you verbally. He's already given you his written word. Now, thank God when he does come, and gives you a special word or whatever. But let me say something about special words. Special words better be specially lined up with the Bible. Amen. Don't get too enthusiastic. I might have to shout myself. Hello? Oh, I got a word for you, brother. Oh, really? Does your word line up with the Bible? Oh, I'm out beyond that thing. You better pick them up by the seat of the pants and throw them out the front door. Hello? No, no, I'm deeper than that. You're too deep for me. Matter of fact, you get deeper in the Bible, you're drowning. Oh, but I know God spoke to me. If it don't line up with his word, if God didn't speak to you. I'm sorry. Are you here? Are y'all on the internet? Don't you turn that off. You know I'm right. Matter of fact, bring all your buddies and you've been telling you're such a spiritual prophet or whatever that, that, that you could tell them what to do and, and you become their Holy Ghost instead of the Bible being the, their leading and guiding and the Spirit of God being their guide who will lead them in accordance with the God's Word. They don't need you to tell them how to interpret it. That's why God has pastors and ministers, established ministers. You might be called to something, but don't put you, don't put you in charge of prophesying anybody or being their Holy Ghost. I posted this week about something about that. After all my years in the ministry, I still get amazed at all the people who think they're called to be everybody else's Holy Ghost. Oh, I got a word. I got count. Oh, brother, I got counsel for you. Ooh. And you know what? People don't need you to tell them who and who not to marry. Now, I've never yet any of seen anybody, I've never yet seen anybody get it right on who to marry, prophesying to them. And I'm going to tell you something else. Probably, we, we, sometimes you don't find it because it causes such destruction, you know, and people, people are supposed to be together or, or we're, we're attracted to each other and we're going to get married. Somebody came in and had a word for them and they broke it off because somebody had a word for them. Can't get married. You had a word. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. No, we, we, our faith won't work on what brother so-and-so said. Who against hope, believe in hope, according to that which, you know, um, Joe down at the local prophet's chamber said to me, I put faith in him. Now listen, Bible, I know the Bible said in the Old Testament said believe his prophets, but the New Testament says being is led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. There is principle in, 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 in honoring those who are set in ministry positions in our lives, the counsel in their lives, but it's not your roommate. Hello? It's not your buddy you knew. I mean, he, you know, they, they, can, they can pray with you and they can, you know, they can show you things from the Bible, but you need to hear from God yourself. Amen. Amen. And you're not going to be able to be in faith from their words. It's going to have to be God's word that you have faith. And God, only God's word produces faith. Amen. God's word produces faith. Abraham, who against it when there was no reason for hope, had an expectancy with his faith according to that which he promised. God has a promise for you. God has a word from you. And most of the time it's going to come out of his written word. Maybe, maybe, I'm just, I'm, I'm, while I'm here. Y'all mind if I just do this while I'm here? You know, because what we're trying to do is, not, is make sure we don't get what? what, what where's our point here? Come on. Don't tolerate a thought to the contrary. Amen? And then, and then once you don't count, you know, you know when, you don't, when you don't count, uh, take a thought to the contrary, you're counting the thing done. But how can you do that if there's no faith? Why? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? What my buddy told me. Hmm, by what? The Word of God. Listen, not even what Pastor Ed said. Even in counsel, it's got to line up with the Word. Are you here? I can have the spirit of counsel and might on me, the spirit of seeing and knowing, 
But whatever I say to you has to line up with the Bible. Or you are not to accept it. It has to be in line with the Bible. I could have had pizza before I came to church. They may have too much uh, spice in my Bojangles sausage this morning. And I got indigestion, and I'm, I'm starting to he hear and see things. Hallelujah. It's because my stomach is upset, not because I heard from heaven. Now, I'm not trying to get you not to, not to be open to the flow of the Holy Ghost. But the Spirit of God's a gentleman. The, the Word and the Spirit agree. They're in harmony one with the other. They're not, they're not working against one. You don't have the Holy Ghost ever saying, uh, you know, uh, I remember when I went to Raymond, they had a group of guys who had been there a, a couple of years before me, and they were teaching that. that they, they, they were teaching. And they said, yeah, when I was in school, we had a group called Burr. Really? Yeah. We had a group called Burr. What was that? Bachelors until Rapture. They were all married. Everybody that had been in Burr was married two years later. Why? Because the Bible says he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Yeah, but in the, you know, Paul's day, he wrote and said it's better if you don't marry. You understand what was going on. There was persecution. You've got to understand things now. That, that they were being persecuted and scattered, you know, uh, and, thing, and it would just be better if, if you could. But he says if you, if you can't, can't contain your flesh, then get married because it's better to marry than to burn. What's talking about? Burning for what woman? Sex. It's better to get married than to want to have sex and can't get it. I know, you, Pastor, that was too blunt. No, that's about, about as blunt as I need to be, especially in this culture. If you're single and you date somebody and you're trying to keep yourself pure and you're having the heart you're, is giving you fits, get married. Hello? You know, just, just, get it, just, get, just get that out of your way. Get married. Have babies. Amen. Come on. Somebody help me. Y'all let me just dig a hole, stand in, and y'all just look at me. I ain't going to help by that hole. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, you better, you better get married if you can't control yourself. So we all getting there. Benigna, help me out here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. The white folks get all stiff. You know I'm talking, right? You start talking about sex, the white folks go, Pff. you ought to see your faces. Come up here, Jerry. <laughs> no, I didn't even turn around and look at him. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Now, bachelors until we, we, they run with prophesying each other. They're supposed to be bachelors until rapture. Had a word. We're supposed to keep ourselves, you know, uncontaminated from the world. It's not, it's not contaminated to get married and have a wife, have sex. That's not contaminated with the world. Under the, when Paul says some of the things he said, they were under such per persecution. And, and they, were, they were tearing homes apart. And they were taking people into slavery and servitude. That it was going to be an issue if you got separated one from the other. Right. She said if you could, it was better not to because it really, and it was really based on what was going on in that day. Right. Had nothing to do with it. it was a good thing to be single. Amen. And even Paul said this, the older women, when they're widowed, you know, let them take care of the things, but the young women, let them, get them get married. Because if you don't, they're going to be busy by it. Just running from house to house, running them out. <laughs> and that's what he said. Hello? Just go get married. Get your man. He, have you ever seen that the Mia Dia movie? They say, you know, oh, no, it was, it was preacher's wife. That's my grandmama. Everybody in church says she needs a man, whatever that means. <laughs> She's always butting her nose in anybody else's business. Hallelujah. Well, all right. See, somebody come along and give you a word that's not in line with the Bible. And you can't act in faith. That's why every one of those guys in that burr club went and got married within a couple of years. Why? They couldn't stand on something that wasn't Bible. They, I know, I listen, I know a guy, um, Lord have mercy, I remember him when he started dating a woman. Now, he, I think at the time, he was like 35, she was like 57. Hello. And about half crippled. And they got together and got to praying. I'm 
going to say something here. It's good to pray, but sometimes it's just not good to pray with certain people. Unless you're doing it in a church setting and you're doing it under an authority of somebody leading prayer. Well, there's nothing wrong with prayer. No, there's nothing wrong with prayer. But there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with prophesying unless you're offering your little prophecy group doing it. Nobody's judging it. No, nobody there to oversee it. Well, they got to praying. They meet at her house. It wasn't long after they got to meet in her house and got to praying, they, she started having tongues and interpretation of tongues. Yay! You young fella. Cougar. We are supposed to get married. She prophesied that to him. And guess what? He fell for it. And she got half his retirement when they got divorced. And he had worked at a big pharmaceutical company in that town. Had an un unbelievably awesome retirement. They matched you dollar for dollar. They won. I mean, you put in $500, they put in $500. Because they didn't want the union. And so they, it, was, it was worth it to them to have these, these awesome deal down in that particular company. And that's no longer exists. It's been bought up by other pharmaceutical companies. But some of, the, some of the drugs you use every day were made by them. How many ever heard of Neosporin? Yeah, they made it. Yeah. He had an awesome retirement. She got half of it. She won't prophesy to get married. She's prophesying to get his money. Yeah. Nobody to judge it. They're just them praying together, and she's having prophecy meetings. And you know what? He can figure out on his own if he wants to be married to you or not. He don't need a word from the Lord to tell him to tell for you to tell him he's supposed to marry you. Amen. Mm. Especially in that circumstance. We had, we, when I first came to Greensboro, a couple in the church had just gotten married. Who had gotten married because one of the ladies in the church they, everybody thought was a prophetess. Let me say something about prophetesses that are flaky. They're flaky. I mean, she was no more a prophetess than I'm an astronaut landed on Jupiter the day before yesterday. Now, that's not my original. I got it from Dad Hagen. Yeah. She prophesied. They got me. Now they're divorced. Hello? Why am I saying all this when, when I'm talking about not taking thoughts to the contrary and counting the thing done? Because, I don't have to get to counting the thing done more tonight. Because when people come along in your life, listen, the devil will probably not use. In most cases, once you get to a certain place in the Lord, you're not going to get the devil coming to you going, that's not God's will. You're too settled in that. You've been in this church as long as most of you have been in this church. When, it, when, when, you, when you start stepping out in faith and so forth, and you got scripture, you're not going to be going, oh, when the devil comes, that's not for you today. You're like, that's a devil. Come on now. What he will use is somebody who comes along with that caring compassionate look in their eye and they put their arm around you and they go now brother yeah yeah God wants you to have it but you think you're making the right decision and that, that's all they'll say that's all they gotta say they can put a thought to the contrary in your head they, they, they planted a thought now a number of years ago, we had this, this, this uh, couple show up in our church. They were going to get married. They got married a, few, a little while after they, they came, came out, to, moved out here. And uh, <clears throat> I noticed a few, a few weeks, month, a few months after they, they kind of got married and were really kind of getting established in the church, she started acting a little weird towards us. I thought, what in the world? So one day we, just, we were all somewhere, and I, and I, and I just uh, kind of prodded her a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know so, so, oh, yeah, yeah, they used to be in our church. Now, I didn't tell them the whole story about them in our church causing trouble and leaving and being part of a church. So I kind of left that out. I mean, they, they caused a bunch of trouble. And, um, and I, I'm, I, you know, at this point, this years later, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting they, God, they got it right with them and God. You know, I don't care. But I'm just saying for, this, for, the, for, for a point, an example. And um, she, said, they, they, she said, I'm having a little bit of a hard time at the church. I said, why? Well, she says, well, Something, I, I'm not sure if everything's right there or not. What are you talking about? 
well, I taught so and so. They went to school my with a family member out at, out at the Bible school, and and, um, and and when they found out where I was going, uh, they said, "Where are you going? Where are y'all going to church?" And I said, "Well, we're going to the Faith of the Victory Church, Ed Taylor Church." He just gave me a look. He didn't say anything. He didn't have to. That look gave her a thought to the contrary. She couldn't even receive the word of God here, because he gave, he planted a thought that undermined her ability to receive the word of God. Satan is not, listen, he didn't, he didn't say I was evil. He didn't say I was possessed. He didn't call us a cult. He just gave her a look. Oh. And just left it alone. Satan will come. And you put your faith out there. And you're standing, and you're, you're in the middle of a battle. Maybe sometimes in a battle for your life. And here comes Mr. Arrogant thinks they no more than Jesus Christ himself, Christian. And you say, I'm standing on such and such, such and such, and such and such. And they kind of go, oh, you're going to one of them churches. And that's all they say. What's happened? They just put a thought in your head. They didn't say you, that the scriptures you were standing on in the Bible. They didn't say that you're crazy. They did, oh, you're going to one of those churches. Oh. And they walk off. They let Satan take that. And now he's got a fault working against you and yourself. So when you get faults working against what you're believing for, you're in a battle. Let me say this. The Bible says don't cast your pearl before the swine. If you know people don't believe like you, shut up. Especially when you're fighting. Amen. And they come and start praying. Say, you know what, brother? Look, look. I love you. Appreciate you. Just, you know, just... Ask God to show you what to do. I know what I'm doing. Keep, you, if you, especially if you're battling for your life. You ain't got time to have to overcome dodo brains. Are you here? Who doesn't believe in healing in the first place? I'm going to tell you something. If I'm in the battle for my life and I know people who don't believe in healing, I ain't talking to them. They ain't going to find out nothing. Why? I don't need their unbelief added to what I'm believing God for. I don't need them working against me. I can't receive those thoughts because they they can just say one word and undermine everything you got. And there are emissaries of the devil sent to do that. In your church, there are emissaries of the devil sent to do that. Yeah, your church. Your roommate. Well, God used them mightily. God can use people mightily in one place and then turn right around and be a fruitcake in another. Hello? How many of you Balaam was? Was he a prophet for God or not? Go study your Bible. But then he got greedy and became an emissary of the devil. And tr that he tried every time he tried everything he could to prophesy against Israel. He wanted to. Hello. Are y'all here? You going home? The Bible talks about those who became shipwrecked in their faith. <coughs> the Bible talks about those who resisted the gospel. When you take your stand on the Word of God, you either need to be with people around you who are full of faith in the Holy Ghost and believe like you, or to keep the other people out. And I don't mean not having any conversation or any dealings with them. I mean keep them out of that part of your life. And they start saying, well, I heard you going over that faith and victory. Listen, I don't know what you think. I don't care what you believe about it. Just shut up. I'm getting what I need to live and not die. And you know what? And if you don't like it, come talk to me after I'm living. Otherwise, shut up. Now, I love you. But I don't need your unbelief and I don't need your thoughts sent. To, oh, brother, I wouldn't. Oh, shut up. Because they're still trying to find out how to get it into you. I wouldn't do anything. I'm just cons I'm con oh, Shut up. So that's not, that's not kind. When you're in a life and death, now I'm, I'm, I kind of moved over to life and death battles. When you're in a life and death battle, sometimes you don't have time to be, be uh, nice. 
especially when they're trying to mess you up. Now, if, it's, if they're unlearned or whatever and saying, well, what, what? I've never heard of that. What are you believing? You, you say, well, the Word of God says this, the Word of God says this, and they go, oh, okay. But if they're, if, if you, 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 and you know, you know by how they're approaching it. Well, brother, we're just going to pray. No, don't, we, don't even pray for me. We're just going to pray for you. You know what that usually means? You've got problems. Don't even pray for me. They're all, he, he, he's got off of that cult. He's mean. He's, he's, he's not even nice. He told me not to even pray for him. If you're going to be praying what you're going to be praying, that's exactly right. Oh, God, show him the error of his ways. Get him out of that cult. We're going to get the cult team down there and rescue him and deprogram him. Hell, they, now that happens. And I know there's, there are real cults out there. We're not one. We're not a cult. You can come and go as you please. You can believe it, believe it or not. That's your, that's your business. We're going to preach it. You can take it. Yeah. It's up to you. But I'm telling you, when it comes to a matter of life and death, you've got to cut people off who are going to undermine that. Now, you can add them back in once you get your answer. Now, see, now, listen, brother, I'm sorry I was rude with you. I'm sorry I was, you considered it rude or whatever, but you were about to put thoughts in my head that were contrary to what I was believing from the Word of God, and it would have taken me weeks, and I didn't have weeks to get that back out of my head. I didn't have time to deal with your unbelief or your resistance to what the Word of God was saying to me. So please forgive me for what you perceive as being rude, but I'm telling you, at that time, I didn't have time to mess with what you were trying to do. Now, if they're sincere Christians, you know what, you know, maybe you arrive, maybe that, that'd be fine. But see, right, right at that moment, Satan's trying to get something into you. He's trying to get something into you so that it'll mess. Anybody ever something? Well, I'm going to pray for you. Anybody ever had anything like that happen to him? Or somebody kind of gave that look? Or just gave some kind of little sarcastic whatever that was a seed that started working against what you were believing? What? That's a thought that entered in, working contrary to what you were believing, sent and designed as an, by the devil to undermine your faith and to cut you down where you couldn't receive. When it's a matter of life and death, you ain't got time to mess with it. Are you here? I said, you ain't got time to mess with it. We got to get back to being bold. I mean, we got to get back to where you're going, I don't receive that in Jesus' name. Hello? I, re I do not receive that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I don't, well, listen. There are things in our lives that we, you know, um, this is why it's important where you go to church. A number of years ago, I know a family, wonderful family. I mean, just as far as the people, the good people, they love the Lord, the good people. Tell me, oh, he, and I, we got talking with them. You went to Brother Hagin school? We love Brother Hagin. They're going to church that didn't believe in anything. Didn't believe in speaking in tongues, didn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, didn't believe in anything. They were sent there to help them get the revelation. God don't send you somewhere where the pastor's against something. Why? Because you're going to undermine everything he's doing. He's going to get in the pulpit and blast it. They stayed long enough. Well, what's going to happen? You're sitting under them. Eventually, it'll get into you what they're preaching. It will. You sit under people who compromise. Eventually, you will compromise. Now, the hottest, latest, greatest thing going across America right now is the Harlem Shake. Go look at some of the stuff where it came from on the internet and see some youth group doing it. One of them's got the cow head on his head doing the Harlem Shake. I mean, you talk, and it came, it actually, it's actually, somebody did some research, it came out of an Egyptian dance to one of their gods. The churches are doing it in youth groups, it's all cool, doing all the same gestures, and, you know. Oh, that's cool. We just be, we just, we're opening up the door to get people in. Let me say something, folks. You don't mess with the devil stuff to get people to come to church. Hello? I mean, they had, they had a picture of a youth group in a big, well-known church in America. The whole youth group's in there doing that whole Harlem shake. Looked like an orgy. Now, well, it wasn't, but that's what it looked like. It was demonic. How'd I get over on that? 
Somebody know? We, oh, we got to be careful about what we let in our lives. Oh, where you go to church. There we go. Where you go to church is important. You get under the influence of something, and you'll water down. You go to a church that doesn't believe in speaking in tongues, you'll get to where you are. Ah, it's not necessary. It's not important. You get to a church that don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, you'll start believing they're not necessary. You go to a church that doesn't believe, well, well we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but we only believe when you can do that, you know, in private settings. That's not the, that Paul didn't write to the church at Corinth to say, only flow in the gifts of the Spirit in private settings. No, he said, in, or in the church, do this, do this, do this, do this. He said the order for it in the church, not in the back room. But you'll get to believe in this. That's how it's supposed to be done. That's not Bible. I believe in the Bible. I believe the gifts of the Spirit should manifest itself in the church. Decently and in order, but in the church. I don't, you know, well, you know somebody say, I heard somebody say one time, well, they'll do the most good in those little private rooms. I believe that if the Holy Spirit manifests himself in, the, in this room, it'll do the most good. I'm open to what the Holy Ghost wants. I don't know what anybody else thinks, but I think God knows what he's doing better than I do. Amen. But just, you know, but they, this family sat in that church long enough to where they, it was, they're, they're, they had a, 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 a child. They got injured in, a, in a, a, an accident. A car hit them while they were out running. And by the time the funeral got there, nobody knew why God did it. Couldn't understand why God did what he did. We just had to accept the will of God. Now, there's people who said they loved Dad Hagen. If they loved Dad Hagen, they wouldn't have believed that. Because they read from his word that that wasn't God's will. God didn't do that to that child. Amen. There was no, there was, you know, you got to have faith to get, you got to be able to get in those situations and have faith to, 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 to get answers. Hello? Are you here? Amen. When you're in a life and death situation, you need people coming to the hospital that got faith. Not, well, you never know what the Lord's going to do. He might or he may not. And you're sitting in the bed going, oh, yeah, you just never know what God's going to do. Hello? You've got to have people of faith. You can't, accept, you can't accept thoughts contrary to what the Word says. You can't accept thoughts that, that interrupt. And, woo, doggy. It's only 1130. I keep, see, it's fine. I keep looking back at that clock. It says 1130. They didn't move it. Thoughts that are contrary to the word rob your faith. And you ain't got time to mess with it. Now, when you got the answer and you don't have to deal with it, you can go back to people and say, now look, what you were trying to say was this. Now, I still don't agree with you. Here's my proof. I got my answer. And I'm going to stay in faith about this. I just want you to know why I was, so, I was so adamant when you came. I didn't have time to mess with you. Because you were going to be used by the devil. I know you didn't mean to, but you were going to be used by the devil to undermine my faith, and I may not be having this conversation with you right now had I listened to you. Blunt. Amen? Hello? Oh, that's not kind. Jesus wouldn't do that. Jesus had a conversation with Peter one day. Y'all remember that conversation? The master of love looked at Peter eyeball to eyeball and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> See, we always put up on Jesus stuff that we, our image of what love is. Yeah, it was love, but Jesus didn't have. The Bible said, Who for the joy that was set before him, Amen. Am I right? When he, when, 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 he, when he went to the cross, amen, he endured the cross. Now notice this also. Remember when the Bible says, as a lamb before the shearer, he opened not his mouth. They questioned him. They mocked him. They mimicked him. And the Bible says he opened not his mouth. Why? He, could, he had to keep himself focused on what he was believing. He didn't have time to talk. He didn't have to argue with people. And when Peter tried to stop him from doing what he was doing, brought, what, what did Peter do? Peter brought a thought where he was committed to fulfilling the will of God and going to the cross. Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus says, get me behind me, Satan. 
And everybody say, wow. Now say it backwards. Wow. Say it upside down. Mom. <laughs> Amen. You tell, me, you tell me to stop talking to you. That wasn't love. I didn't call you Satan like Jesus called Peter. Hello? And he's the master of love. Hello? And he called Peter the devil. Now, if you really analyze that deeper, he's talking to the spirit that was trying to use him. But that's the same spirit that will try to use people to get to you. You don't have time to mess with that when you're in a battle. See, Jesus was focused on what he had to do, and he didn't have time to battle his chief of staff. Hello? That's what Peter was. He didn't have time to battle his chief of staff over what he was going to do or not going to do. So he said, get me behind me, Satan. Get rid of this crazy, goofed up, modern definition of what the love of God is. That it's some kind of sloppy, goobity got garbage that you just put up with everything anybody else spews out and call putting up with it love. When you're in a life and death battle, hello, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you're more useful to the kingdom of God here alive and healed than you are dead. Amen. Amen. 